Hello, and welcome to the Health is Fluid webinar series hosted by Impedimed. My name is Joanne Yao, and I am the Senior Director of Marketing for Impedimed. Today's webinar is about reducing the incidence of chronic cancer-related lymphedema, a comprehensive look at new data, practice economics, and why LDEX is the next primary vital sign. We have two exceptional speakers joining us today. Dr. Shrag Shah, Director of Breast Radiation Oncology and Clinical Research at the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Cleveland Clinic, and Dr. Cherie Prentice, breast cancer survivor, a lymphedema patient, and founder of the Live Today Foundation. Thank you both for joining us. The webinar will begin with presentations from Dr. Cherie and Dr. Shaw, followed by a question and answer session. We encourage you to participate by submitting questions via the Q&A icon on your screen. At the end of the presentations, we will answer as many questions as possible in the time allotted. We will also follow up on any questions that we are not able to address live. We're happy to offer certificates of completion for your participation in this webinar upon request. To request a certificate, you may either respond to your registration confirmation email, email us at info at impedimed.com, or contact your local Impedimed representative. All webinars are available for replay approximately one week following the event. You may find them on Impedimed's Oncology YouTube channel. Please make sure to subscribe while you're there. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Shuri. I'm Dr. Cherie Prentice, a physician, a cancer survivor, and a lymphedema patient. I once enjoyed a full life as a highly successful occupational and environmental medicine physician, overseeing 22 facilities while raising two beautiful daughters until the moment when everything changed. October 1st, 2008, I found a mass in my right breast, and it was stage 2A invasive ductal carcinoma. I underwent a partial mastectomy, a level 1 lymph node dissection where 3 out of 16 lymph nodes were positive for cancer, 15 rounds of chemotherapy, and 33 treatments of radiation. One year after treatment, I developed disabling lymphedema in my right arm, hand, and fingers. And at the age of 42, after 16 years of practicing, I lost a career I've wanted ever since I was two years old and I had to completely reinvent myself. It's probably been your experience that once they finish their treatment, many cancer patients return to work and lead full and active lives. But thousands of us don't. Lymphedema? is a secondary blow to our physical and emotional well-being. We lack the resources to help us deal with negative body image perceptions and other psychosocial impacts of lymphedema. And we want to help those coming after us so that other cancer patients won't have to live through our plight. I want to thank you for joining this webinar and for working to change the outcomes for your patients. You have already taken the first step, which is to acknowledge the impact of lymphedema on the lives of cancer patients. You can further help by providing care for the whole patient and helping them regain control of their life. You are helping your patients take back control of their lives before one disease, cancer, which may be cured, causes another disease, lymphedema, which can't. Here are steps you can take to preserve the health and wellness of the whole patient. Number one, educate your patients on risk factors, treatment, and prevention. Number two, see what leading cancer centers are doing to reduce the incidence of chronic cancer-related lymphedema. Number three, 
Learn about the latest advances in bioimpedance spectroscopy for testing of subclinical lymphedema. Number four, understand the reimbursement landscape and practice economics for LDEX. And finally, implement a lymphedema prevention program in your practice. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned for Dr. Shaw. Good evening. My name is Chirag Shah. I'm a breast cancer radiation oncologist. I serve as the director of breast radiation oncology at the Cleveland Clinic. Today, I'll be presenting Reduce the Incidence of Chronic Cancer-Related Lymphedema, a comprehensive look at new data, practice economics, and why LDEX is the next primary vital sign. Before I begin, I'd like to, doc- I'd like to thank Dr. Cherie for her discussion. When we look at the incidence of breast cancer-related lymphedema, we see that there's varying rates of lymphedema based on the type of local regional therapy as well as adjuvant treatments. We see higher rates of lymphedema with mastectomy as well as with axillary lymph node dissection. We also see elevated rates of lymphedema with regional nodal radiation as well as the consideration for some forms of chemotherapy. With regards to risk factors for breast cancer-related lymphedema, Studies have found that, for example, tumors located in the upper outer quadrant, postoperative axillary trauma, infection, hematoma, and seroma, as well as axillary radiation, axillary dissection, extent of axillary dissection, presence of an axillary recurrence, or a large number of removed uh, positive lymph nodes to all be associated with breast cancer-related lymphedema. These are images depicting the stages of breast cancer-related lymphedema with the far left image demonstrating stage one or reversible lymphedema, the middle picture demonstrating stage two, which is considered spontaneously irreversible lymphedema, and the far right picture demonstrating stage three or lymphostatic elephantiasis uh, lymphedema. With regards to lymphedema diagnostic modalities, there are many to choose from. The most well-known often is circumference measurements, which are easy to perform, are low cost and portable. They were used in some of the original clinical trials evaluating axillary surgeries as well. However, they are limited by their low sensitivity and inability to detect subclinical disease with no consensus standardized metrics on how to initiate therapy based on circumference measurements. Similarly, water displacement has low sensitivity and inability to detect subclinical disease, um, though it is easy to perform and was used in previous studies. Patient surveys are very easy to perform, but have low sensitivity as well, and really cannot detect subclinical stage zero lymphedema. While pyrometry has the ability to detect increased sensitivity for breast cancer lymphedema, it comes at the expense of large space requirements, cost, and a lack of long-term data. Bioimpedance spectroscopy, on the other hand, is highly sensitive and able to detect subclinical disease. It's portable and easy to use in clinics as published, Um, though some cons may be a lack of long-term data and the inability to use in patients with implanted electronic devices. At this time, I'm going to discuss the PREVENT interim analysis, which was a randomized trial evaluating the use of bioimpedance spectroscopy. As I mentioned, the PREVENT trial is a randomized trial initially planned for 1,100 patients. Inclusion criteria included patients with stage 1 to 3 breast cancer with at least one of the following features, mastectomy, axillary dissection, removal of more than six sentinel nodes, regional nodal irradiation, or taxane-based chemotherapy. Patients were randomized to be followed with bioimpedance spectroscopy or tape measurement. We initially utilized a trigger point of 10 with bioimpedance, which was subsequently switched to 6.5 based on a growing set of literature supporting this as a lower trigger for subclinical lymphedema. Tape measurement used the standard of 5 to 10% increase with all patients who had greater than 10% circumference measures referred for complex decongestive physiotherapy. Patients triggering with either BIS or tape measure underwent four weeks of compression sleeve and gauntlet treatment for 12 hours a day. Progression regardless of arm was defined as a 10% or greater increase in circumference measurement. And these patients were all referred for complex decongestive physiotherapy with all patients not triggering and progressing, having three years of follow-up. This is a figure looking at the pre-surgical and post-surgical assessments. 
With regards to pre-surgical assessment for entry into the trial, we were looking for patients who had histologically confirmed breast cancer and planned surgery. Post-surgically, we ensured that they had at least one of the following criteria I'd previously mentioned, including mastectomy, axillary surgery, taxane-based chemotherapy. This breaks down the study into the two randomized arms. In the tape measure arm, patients who continued to have less than a 5% increase were followed for three years. Patients with 5 to 10% triggered intervention, and after intervention were followed with volume measurements. If they had a less than 10% increase, they continued follow-up for three years, and if they had a 10% or greater increase, they were referred for CDP. Patients who had 10% or greater increase at any time were referred to CDP. In the BIS or LDEX arm, patients who maintained a value less than 6.5 were followed for three years. Patients who triggered at 6.5 underwent volume, metric, volume measurements, and those at greater than 10% referred to CDP, similar to the tape measure arm. Those that maintained an under 10% underwent surveillance following intervention and were continued for three years if they maintained a volume less than 10%. If it was 10% or greater, they were referred for complex decongestive physiotherapy. These are the results of the interim analysis. As we can see on the left, tape measure had more triggers than bioimpedance spectroscopy. However, when we follow these patients in interim analysis, there was a 10% absolute reduction in the rate of progression to complex decongestive physiotherapy with bioimpedance spectroscopy. Though this was non-significant given the interim analysis and the limited number of patients included. These are further results from the interim analysis. You can see we had similar rates of follow-up in both arms um, and similar rates of progressing before intervention in both arms. As I had mentioned, there was increased rates of trigger with tape measure, though the more important endpoint and the primary endpoint of the study was progression, which was a 10% difference. I'll now discuss the recently published meta-analysis looking at breast cancer-related lymphedema and diagnostic techniques for lymphedema. The meta-analysis looked at a total of 50 studies evaluating more than 67,000 women. There was a comparison of rates of lymphedema between bioimpedance spectroscopy, circumference or tape measurement, as well as background studies. We looked at the results. And overall, the annualized breast cancer-related lymphedema rate was 4.9% with background, 7.7% with circumference, and 1.5% with bioimpedance spectroscopy. Cumulatively, over the course of follow-up, that translated to a roughly 13% rate of lymphedema with background, 17% with circumference, and only 3.1% with bioimpedance. This represents a 69% reduction with bioimpedance as compared to background, and an 81% reduction as compared to circumference. These are the full results of this study, and we started off by looking at if follow-up had any impact on the outcomes. And what we saw is that even in short follow-up studies, this benefit held, or in studies with greater than two years of follow-up, this benefit held. We also looked at the type of study, and regardless of whether the study was prospective, randomized, or retrospective, similar findings were seen with regards to bioimpedance compared to background or with circumference. We looked at high risk factors as well. When we look at patients who had less than 50% axillary lymph node dissection, benefit with bioimpedance was seen as compared to background. And regardless of axillary lymph node dissection status, less than 50% or greater, a benefit was seen with bioimpedance as compared to circumference. Similarly, when looking at mastectomy rates, bioimpedance had reduced rates as compared to background, uh, whether the mastectomy rate was low or high. Similarly, with bioimpedance in a high-risk mastectomy population, there was a reduction in lymphedema as compared to circumference measurements. So an important question that I'm commonly asked is whether LDEX discriminates by the type of local regional therapy. This was evaluated in a subset analysis of the PREVENT trial. We evaluated the rate of triggering by axillary surgery type, extent of radiation to lymph nodes. And what we found is when patients did not receive lymph node radiation, bioimpedance triggered in 13% of sentinel lymph node patients and 25% of axillary patients, showing a clear discrimination by extent of axillary surgery. 
When we looked at extensive lymph node radiation versus no lymph node radiation, when patients with sentinel lymph node, we again saw clear discrimination with bioimpedance, though we did not see a difference when looking at patients with axillary dissection. This may represent the fact that axillary dissection overwhelms the impact of extensive versus no regional nodal radiation. However, in the tape measure arms, trigger rates were seen of 25% or greater for most subgroups, with really no clear discrimination by extent of axillary surgery or axillary radiation therapy. This is a table from the study that I just discussed showing that in the bioimpedance arms, there was a clear discrimination by extent of regional nodal radiation. However, in the tape measure arm, you see consistently elevated rates of 25% or more with a lack of clear discrimination. So how do we incorporate LDEX into our clinical practices? This is an important question and has clinical as well as pragmatic ramifications. So the first question is, who should we take measurements in and how should we perform those measurements? In terms of a patient population, we recommend a pretreatment baseline uh, in patients who are at risk for a cancer-related lymphedema. So for example, breast cancer, melanoma, pelvic cancers. Um, we also recommend post-surgical testing in patients whose treatment put them at risk. So, for example, an axillary lymph node dissection or in someone who has a, a inguinal lymph node dissection, sentinel lymph node patients, mastectomy patients, regional node radiation, and tax and chemotherapy. The image on the right demonstrates how to take a SOZO-based measurement. We have the patient place their bare hands and feet on the device. It takes about 30 seconds for a measurement, and it's a non-invasive test. In terms of LDEX testing guidelines, we have recommended that the measurement perform prior to local, regional, or neoadjuvant therapy, and following local regional treatments performed every three months for three years. In years four and later, the frequency of measurements can be decreased as clinically indicated to twice a year. We initially used a trigger of 10 for breast cancer-related lymphedema. However, with newer data, we switched the trigger point to 6.5 in PREVENT, which is now the current recommendation. When we reach such a trigger, we recommend initiation of therapy with sleeve and gauntlet for four weeks. So one of the questions is whether bioimpedance is the new breast cancer survivorship vital sign. When we think about vital signs, we think about things that give us an understanding of the patient's condition, things like heart rate and blood pressure and weight. Well, following breast cancer, we use commonly uh, standardized techniques such as follow-up breast exams and mammograms. But how do we follow up for late side effects of treatment? For example, cardiac disease and lymphedema. Understanding that these risks are based on local regional systemic therapies. Bioimpedance represents that type of vital sign for the assessment of breast cancer related lymphedema. It has a high sensitivity and ability to detect subclinical changes. It's easy to use, requires limited time and resource constraints, and has standard guidelines. Just as importantly, it provides a gateway to initiate treatment. When patients trigger with an LDEX above 6.5, a sleeve and gauntlet can be initiated, and therefore we can counsel patients on the ability to then subsequently reduce their rates of chronic lymphedema. At this time, I'll discuss the cost and value associated with the management of breast cancer-related lymphedema. She et al. evaluated the cost associated with lymphedema. In this claim study, looking at outcomes two years after the start of cancer treatment, they found that 10% of patients had lymphedema claims, though this may be an underestimate, with increased claims seen in patients undergoing axillary dissection and chemotherapy. They found increased medical costs in patients with lymphedema, who are twice as likely to have cellulitis and lymphangitis as well. The majority of costs for these breast cancer-related lymphedema patients were associated with outpatient care, including mental health, diagnostic imaging, and visits of moderate and high complexity. This is a table of patients uh, from the She et al. study, looking at those that had cellulitis and lymphangitis in the first set of columns, and those with other complications in the right set of columns. What you can see is that patients with breast cancer-related lymphedema had a higher rate of both cellulitis and lymphangitis, as well as other complications. They also had higher rates of comorbidities.
This is also from the She et al. study looking at two-year medical costs for women with and without a diagnosis of breast cancer-related lymphedema, showing the total costs are roughly 86707 versus 64554 We see that the majority of difference in costs were actually non-cancer-related, and an increase in costs associated with physical therapy were seen, as well as outpatient costs, as I previously noted. A study from Basta et al. looked at the cost of advanced lymphedema. The study included over 56,000 women with 2.3% of women admitted for complicated lymphedema within two years of breast surgery. Women with complicated lymphedema had a five times increase in all-cause admissions versus patients without, and significantly increased healthcare costs as well with the charges of 58,000 versus 31,000. Axar lymph node dissection in this study was associated with complicated lymphedema. This is a figure from that study looking at the risk of complicated lymphedema, and you can see that it was lowest in mastectomy patients with implant expander reconstruction, highest mastectomy with tissue reconstruction, uh, though similar rates were seen with mastectomy without reconstruction. Lumpectomy without reconstruction also had low rates as well. This is a table from the study looking at rates of complicated lymphedema and showing the difference in costs. Also showing increased numbers of all-cause visits as well, as well as lymphedema incidence rate ratio. An important question is what are the costs of prospective surveillance? Stout et al. evaluated the cost of prospective surveillance with traditional symptom-based treatment when patients are referred for treatment with later stages. The model assumed one-third of patients would develop early-stage lymphedema and included the cost of screening and interventions. Overall, the cost with prospective surveillance was roughly $636 a year, while managing late-stage lymphedema cost over $3,000, with the study concluding that prospective surveillance is an emerging standard of care. This is a table taken from the study looking at prospective monitoring of all patients and treating with early intervention costing a total of $38,000 as compared to impairment-based intervention costing more than $104,000. And this is a breakdown of looking at prospective surveillance versus referral and the costs associated. We then decided to look at the cost of managing lymphedema when incorporating LDEX. This is a study based on the interim analysis of the PREVENT trial, which I've previously discussed, and then frequency of measurements were based on current clinical guidelines. This study included the cost of the SOZO unit, staff required for measurements, sleeves, cost for sleeves for triggered patients, as well as the cost for CDP for progression as well as complicated lymphedema. And we did use the previously mentioned BOSS et al. study for costs associated with complex and complicated lymphedema. In the model, we assume the same rate of triggers as was seen in the interim analysis with similar rates of progression, though we did incorporate other literature sources such that the progression to CDP long-term was roughly 30% in tape measure and 4.9% with LDEX. The results of this study showed that the cost per visit and the cost per patient accounting for device and staff costs as expected, decrease with the increasing number of patients seen and over time. The cost of staff did not drastically alter the cost per visit or patient due to the short time required to make measurements, typically assumed to be around five minutes per measurement. These are the results of the study looking at the cost per visit and the cost per patient with bioimpedance spectroscopy. You can see with 50 patients a year, which accounts for 200 visits, the cost per visit including staff, was $115 or $116, with minimal increase in cost due to staff, and the cost per patient was around $500. However, that same number of patients at three years, the cost have dropped dramatically to roughly $49 or $51 per visit and $393 or $404 per patient, and this is only for accounting for direct costs. When we then incorporate the costs of sleeves and complex decongestive physiotherapy, we can see a big difference. 
even in the study or a patient population of 50 patients per year, there's a drastic reduction in costs. When you look at the total cost difference, without hospitalizations, you can still see a benefit with bioimpedance as compared to tape measure. And when you incorporate hospitalization rates, the cost savings become drastic. Similar, when we look at the same type of analysis, instead of at one year, at three years, we see similar benefits seen with the use of bioimpedance as compared to tape measure. So overall, we found that overall costs lower with LDAC surveillance as compared to tape measure when accounting for measurements, compression, sleeves, and CDP. Regardless of patient volume, LDACs can represent a cost savings. And when incorporating hospitalization costs, further increase in cost savings were seen with LDACs. In conclusion, we found that breast cancer-related lymphedemas associated with increased healthcare costs, complicated lymphedemas associated with increased hospitalizations and costs, and prospective surveillance model of care reduces costs as compared to treating symptoms. When we look at a prospective surveillance model of care with LDEX, we found reduced, reduced costs versus tape measurement surveillance, with costs per visit and per patient continuing to decrease with increased volumes of patients seen. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have. Thank you, Dr. Shah and Dr. Sharif for your presentations. I invite you to come off of mute and um, come on your video and join us for a Q&A session. Uh, if anyone would like to ask a question of Dr. Shah or Dr. Sharif, please go ahead and enter that question using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. We do have a couple questions so far, and as we wait for more to come in, I wanted to ask each of you just to talk a little bit more about what you're currently doing. So, um, Dr. Cherie, you know, you founded the Live Today Foundation to help breast cancer survivors and patients at risk of lymphedema. Can you talk a little bit about what the foundation is doing today? Yes, um, the foundation, uh, fortunately, we are growing by leaps and bounds. Um, we were initially founded to do three things. One, to help physicians um, be aware and, and, and more cognizant in diagnosing lymphedema and making them aware of all of the psychosocial impacts of the disease that we as physicians, unless you are a patient, you don't necessarily think about it. Um, and then secondly, to um, alert patients what they had. In, in my travels, I encountered thousands of untreated lymphedema patients. They just thought they had some swelling. And so we were educating patients about what they had and the importance of treatment. And then finally providing free compression garments to under-resourced cancer patients and survivors who needed the garments, but they just couldn't financially afford them. Um, and so we've continued with that mission, but now grateful for Impedimed for coming along with some new technology that will afford us the, that now has afforded us the opportunity to detect a clinical lymphedema. And so now I'm hoping that Live Today just becomes the organization that provides those individuals who need it, those four weeks uh, of compression garments because we have detected them when it is still subclinical and we can get them to reverse uh, their lymphedema. So I'm looking forward to the day that all we're doing is supplying garments for those four week period of time. Uh, but we're really working uh, and partnering with Impedimed to really bring an end to chronic debilitating lymphedema. Because although I beautified mine and blung it out because you know I figured if I got to wear it, I might as well try to look cute. It really has been a thorn in my side and it disabled me from clinical practice. So had this technology been available when I was diagnosed, I could still be practicing clinical medicine today. Thank you, Dr. Shuri, for sharing. Uh, Dr. Shah, would you mind sharing a little bit about how you are currently using LDEX in practice in your practice at the Cleveland Clinic? Sure. So, um, you know, our Sozo machine sits right next to our scale um, in our clinic um, and basically functions, as I had mentioned, as a vital sign. So when patients come in and get their their weights measured as well as their uh, other vital signs, they get their Sozo measured. Um, and so this is kind of a part of their breast cancer treatment and subsequent follow-up. Um, and so for each follow-up visit, they're subsequently 
um, being able to get measurements um, and, and kind of see real time kind of what's going on with their affected arm. Um, and then based on, you know, discussions, we we're able to intervene with interventions based on changes in that LDAC score. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you, Dr. Shuri. So we're getting some um, good questions in and we just got a question, Dr. Shah. Are you testing every single patient? It's a great question. So, you know, as the increased risk of lymphedema goes up in theory, the, the need for screening goes up. So we know that, you know, a lumpectomy patient alone is gonna have low rates of lymphedema with a sentinel lymph node. Whereas a patient who has mastectomy, um, axillary radiation, taxane-based chemo taxane chemotherapy is gonna have a substantial risk of lymphedema. Um, so we do have clinical practice guidelines as well as the prevent inclusion criteria. But typically I think about, you know, assessing patients for lymphedema who are receiving axillary radiation, who are having, you know, six or more nodes removed, whether that be an extensive sentinel biopsy or an axillary dissection, those that are getting chemotherapy. I would consider that the baseline number of patients we should surveil. Um, and then you can also incorporate in, in other risk patients, um, other factors such as elevated BMIs, hypertension and smoking as well um, to further increase kind of our sensitivity to detect lymphedema. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Now I'm getting a couple of questions about the data. I'd like to go there next. Um, the first question is with regard to the lymphedema meta-analysis. Um, we had a question about what the background studies included and then maybe how that compares to the other groups of BIS and tape measure studies. So could you talk a little bit more detail about what those background studies were? Sure. So the concept of a background study was predicated upon a previous meta-analysis published in The Lancet from Decipio et al. that basically looked at rates of lymphedema. So background incorporated any study um, other than those that incorporated bioimpedance spectroscopy or tape measure that looked at rates of, of lymphedema um, postoperatively. So it's, it's a, it's a catch-all basket, and certainly that's a limitation, um, but also to provide consistency with previous lymphedema meta-analyses, we kept that definition the same for this follow-up meta-analysis. Thank you. And then how does the background group compare to the circumference and the this groups? In terms of um, outcomes or in terms of characteristics, I apologize. So in terms of characteristics? I mean, overall, they were relatively well balanced. I think obviously there are going to be some differences, and I think that speaks to the nature of a meta-analysis with lots of studies performed. Um, but they were overall relatively well balanced. Part of the other thing we did was we also looked at outcomes based on specific factors. So looking at rates of lymph node, axillary lymph node dissection and mastectomy to also try to compensate for any differences in patient and treatment characteristics between the groups. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and then would you just, again, recap briefly what differences you did see between the groups and the results? So I think the biggest takeaway results were that both the annualized and cumulative incidence of lymphedema was reduced with the use of bioimpedance as compared to both um, background as well as tape measure. And, and the relative reductions were 69% and 81% respectively. So um, I think to me, that's kind of like the headline takeaway number to be forthright with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have some questions here about the PREVENT uh, trial. Um, the first question is we do we have a question about what is the sensitivity and specificity of this? And uh, Dr. Shaw, do you wanna take that question or would you like me to? Um, Joanne, if you wanna feel that one, that would be great. Sure. So for the, for the audience, um, the, the sensitivity of LDEX in detecting lymphedema has been studied in a number of studies. The earliest study was um, by Cornish in 2001, looking at the ability of LDEX to detect whether or not a patient has lymphedema or does not have lymphedema. Uh, in this case, they looked at a three standard deviation change in LDEX from baseline and found that LDEX was 100% sensitive and 98% specific in detecting lymphedema. Fast forward um, 12 years, and there's a study by Fu published in 2013, 
looking at the ability of LDEX to detect subclinical lymphedema using a two standard deviation change, which is the change that was used in the PREVENT trial. In that study, LDEX was 80% sensitive and 90% specific in detecting subclinical lymphedema. And Dr. Shah, I know that when you look at the trigger rate for tape measure and BIS in the prevent interim analysis. Did that give us any insight as well? Yeah, it's a commonly asked question, you know, is why did tape measure trigger more than BIS? And, and I think this um, argues to kind of the lack of value of a tape measure, right? In the sense that you're getting probably false positives um, that really aren't true lymphedema and true signatures for the development of chronic lymphedema as compared to BIS. Um, you know, despite having more triggers, um, the key takeaway number is the rate of chronic lymphedema. And what we're seeing using complex decongestive physiotherapy as a surrogate for that is um, really significantly increased rates of uh, chronic lymphedema through CDP with tape measure as compared to surveillance with BIS, um, despite these groups being uh, relatively well balanced. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so we have another question that kind of relates to the inclusion criteria for, um, for the PREVENT trial. And um, one of our audience members asked as a lymphedema therapist that she never heard of the taxane-based chemotherapy being a risk factor for lymphedema. Um, but it is an inclusion criteria for the PREVENT trial. Um, do you have any background on, on um, how we, know that taxane-based chemotherapy is a risk factor for lymphedema? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, as a radiation oncologist, you know, to be honest, when this was first brought to my attention, it was a little bit outside of, um, you know, my wheelhouse. I, I'm, a, as a radiation oncologist, not someone who, you know, uh, is commonly associated with systemic therapies. But I think that's the beauty of the PREVENT trial. When we kind of met as, as a group of investigators and all discussed the literature, this was a, a risk factor based on the data that was brought up and so subsequently included as a uh, inclusion criteria for the study. Thank you, thank you. Now, um, Dr. Shuri, it's interesting. We're getting a couple of questions here from um, looks like a patient perspective. And one of the questions we have here is, what does a lymphedema disability look and feel like? And this is for, she says, for a newbie like me. <laughs> Any context you can offer about what it feels like? It, it feels like, oh, from, a, from a real physical, first of all, let me test my volume. Is my volume good now? Can you hear me pretty good? Yes, we hear you great. Thank you. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. From a standpoint of what it feels like, it, it feels like I'm the textbook. It is painful. It feels heavy. It feels like it's about to burst. Um, I have the um, reticent um, neur neuropathy along with my chemo, uh, that the chemotherapy cause. So it, it's, a, it's a bad way to feel all the way around. But when you think about it in perspective of I battled chemo, I battled surgery, I battled radiation, I can now battle this. And that was the, the mindset that I had to take with regards to my just some swelling that individuals had told me um, that I should be grateful that it was just some swelling. I got personally angry when I heard that statement made and I, I didn't, it didn't sit well with me, hence why I started the foundation because it's not just some swelling. Um, but you can get through it um, from, a, from the standpoint of garments. Hey, you know what? Bling them out, try to make them look as cute as possible. Um, but I would recommend that you as a newbie use this as an opportunity to raise awareness. That was the main reason why I added crystals to mine, not really because I was trying to be cute. That really is just a flippant way to bring humor to the fact that I decided that I was going to use my garments as a way to not only bring awareness and educate individuals on breast cancer and all of its complications and worth nightmares if you don't get treated, but I also use it as an opportunity to let individuals uh, be aware and cognizant of, of the fact that complications, 
even when your cancer is considered cured, I am, this will be 13 years for me, October. I will never be cured from this. And had something like the Sozo device been around when I was diagnosed, um, I could potentially be on the Dr. Shaw side where I'm just giving um, through real anecdotal information and data and advice to physicians who are eager to see about their patient survivorship and take the whole patient um, survivorship and lifestyle in mind, I could have been on the other side because I still could have been in the treatment process where I was on the other side of the table. I am not. Um, so you can be a living witness and a living testimony, um, or you could choose to let it wear you down. You sound like a person that you will not let it wear you down. So use this as an opportunity to make a difference and not allow anybody else to become like you and I. Thank you, Dr. Sheree. And, and thank you for the question as well. It's, it's exciting to see that we have some patients um, joining our webinars, which is pretty wonderful, the reach that we're able to get. Uh, it, we've had a couple questions come in about protocol and how to set up lymphedema prevention in practice. So one of the questions here is, if you're looking at a cancer institute as a whole, what is the best location for LDEX to capture as many at-risk patients as possible? Is it in the radiation oncologist office as opposed to the surgeon's office? What do you recommend, Dr. Shaw? Yeah, I, I probably should have clarified. My, my office is actually a multidisciplinary breast clinic. So my SOZO unit is where uh, my surgical colleagues, my medical oncology colleagues, my genetics colleagues, and my other disciplines uh, that I work with are all at. So um, it's not a radiation oncology office. It's more of a breast clinic. Um, but I would say that, you know, in talking to colleagues throughout the country who are engaged in lymphedema, um, it tends to be in places where breast cancer patients are going to be seen both preoperatively and in follow-up. That often is a surgeon, surgeon's office, but depending on the environment, the enterprise, the institute, um, that can be a breast clinic, that could be um, a medical oncologist's office, a radiation oncology office. Um, in some cases, I know that in you know, some institutes that clinic varies in location from place to place. Um, and so in some cases, I've even I've heard of the unit being moved um, based on where the breast cancer patients are, right? At the end of the day, I think that's the beauty of the, the SOZO unit. And then the, um, you get a touch screen that comes with it. And that's how you're able to kind of look at the results of everything. And I think the beauty of it is, is it's a pretty mobile setup. So it's really where you're seeing breast cancer patients um, that are at risk. Thank you. And another protocol question, what, what uh, do you advise for um, cases when a true baseline measurement was not achieved, so they didn't get a baseline before treatment, and maybe the first time they're seeing the patient is there either after surgery or after radiation therapy? So, you know, obviously in a perfect world, we would obviously be able to get measurements preoperatively. I think we all, most of us on this call all know we, we, we work kind of in areas where that's not always possible and for variable reasons. Sometimes, you know, a patient was seen in another institution. Sometimes they weren't able to get the measurement when they came in preoperatively. Um, actually, the current clinical practice guidelines, which we can share a link to, um, actually incorporate that, right? Because we know practically and pragmatically, not all patients get pre-op measurement. So you can still use um, LDEX you know, and bioimpedance, even if patients don't have a preoperative measurement. Thank you. And we have a question about the sensitivity of LDEX in breast lymphedema. And I did wanna state that um, LDEX measures lymphedema of the arms and legs. Does not currently, it's not currently able to measure lymphedema of the breast. So um, it's really focused on arms and legs. Thank you for the question. You know, interesting question here, Dr. Shaw, and one that I know you and I have personally discussed before. Um, how do you explain it if LDEX shows that the lymph is as normal, right? Normal for lymphedema. The therapist, through their exam and experience, determines that lymphedema is present. Um, how can we explain that? Sure. So I think that the way to break that down is to look at a couple of things. And, you know, number one, when we look at 
you know, basically clinical studies and research, we, we can see that tape measure has high rates of intra and inter observer variability, um, and that it's not able to be sensitive. I mean, the, the clinical data that's been published supports those findings. On the flip side, um, we see patients with bioimpedance where it's been consistently shown to have higher sensitivity, the ability to detect subclinical lymphedema. So then how do I explain situations where, you know, a, a physical therapist feeling something and is classifying that well, there's a couple of things. Number one, we know that some patients can have transient edema postoperatively that resolves. Um, that may be something that's being appreciated on exam, but is actually not something that's gonna be a harbinger of chronic lymphedema. So I think that's one possibility. I think number two, um, you know, we have to look at things in the totality, right? I think that um, we have to look at the data as a whole and say that when we look at that data as a whole, it's pretty clear that you're gonna have a higher sensitivity with a technique like bioimpedance as compared um, to a tape measurement or a clinical exam, and then it's going to be more sensitive. Thank you, Dr. Shah. You know, we get a lot of questions also about what is the patient reaction to the program? Um, and, and there's, you know, concern that if, when a patient is diagnosed with breast cancer, you know, obviously it's, it's extremely impactful on their lives. And um, the idea of bringing up lymphedema so that you can get a pretreatment baseline with Veldex um, seems like that would be overwhelming. You know, Dr. Sheree, what can you speak to with regard to patient education and patient awareness, um, even at the time of diagnosis when someone would be overwhelmed with the impact of their diagnosis and the treatment ahead? Um, here's what I will say. I instruct everyone who receives that diagnosis to try to have an advocate with them at every appointment, right? To take the notes, to, to catch the things and hear the things that you don't. That we all can't have that. I didn't have it when I went through. But I can tell you this, after I received the diagnosis and heard the word cancer, yes, it was overwhelming, but I don't think that hearing the discussion of lymphedema would make it e any more overwhelming. So I guess what I'm saying is by the time you hear that C word, you really want to hear as much as you possibly can. That's going to have you fare well after this is all over because your doctors are always assuring you, we're going to take good care. You're going to get this cancer taken care of. We're going to, you know, you, we're going to pull you through this. We're going to get you through this. And they do. And, and my hat off to all of my physicians, my breast surgeon, my medical aunt, my red aunt, all of them that made sure that I lived, right? But at the end of the day, I lived, but there was a survivorship on the other side of that. And I would have much rather, since you gave me all of the other risk factors, all of the other things that could happen, have that serious conversation with me and say, Sheree, lymphedema is a real risk. One in three at-risk cancer patients will develop secondary lymphedema related to their treatment. And we want to make sure that you're okay. So for today, just know that we're going to get a baseline score on you just to see where your fluid levels are. And we're going to monitor you periodically thereafter, just to make sure we can get a tab on if and when subclinical lymphedema happens and when it occurs so that we can divert it and do something to prevent it from being chronic. Had I heard that, that would not have been more overwhelming to me than everything else that I had heard, that I was gonna to have to have surgery, that I was most likely looking at chemo, that I was most looking like looking at radiation. What that conversation about lymphedema and the possibility and the, the possibility of preventing it could have done for me was, okay, I'm gonna do what I need to do to treat myself now. Now, this is something that I can do that will, I can look forward to not having when I'm all over this, when it's all said and done, I'll be okay. So to me, I don't think having that conversation, we're not, I don't have the expectation that physicians will sit down and have a 10, 15 minute long conversation with the patient about the risk of lymphedema, but just merely stating what I stated, what their risks are, and that here's a way for us to kind of keep tabs on it and follow up on whether or not it's occurring with you, that would provide me comfort, not something else for me to be scared of because I was scared of it anyway. Interesting. And what do you think would have been the right time for it to be introduced into the conversation if you consider your treatment that way? 
I appreciate having baseline prior. And, and that probably is my physician thinking as well, right? I want to get where I'm at. So I can compare it to what was baseline. My relationship with my breast surgeon, that was the that was the doctor that gave me the diagnosis. I would have been comforted and I would have received it hearing it from her. She was the first person that gave me the news. If she had given me that news and with all of the other risk factors that I was looking at and had told me, well, three, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're looking at for treatment. But here's what we're going to do to make sure that on the other side of this, when it's all said and done, because you're getting through this, on the other side of this, we want you healthy and whole and complete. I would have received it coming from her. But I also saw, saw my med onc prior to surgery as well. But it was just a quick visit. She was going to have the more detailed talk with me. You know what? Later on, once the surgery was complete, when she had a better idea of what my chemotherapy would have looked like. Some people have chemotherapy before surgery. So then I think the med onc would be the best person to have that conversation with because that's the doctor that you're building the relationship with early on in your cancer journey. Mine was my breast surgeon. I would have easily and welcomed the conversation coming from her because she was my first point of contact. Thank you, Dr. Sherry. Now, um, I'm gonna go back to protocol because we did get one other one come in, uh, question come in, and it has to do with the compression therapy. So um, Dr. Shaw, we get this question a lot. So two part question. In the PREVENT trial, why was the class two therapy, um, that, that pressure range selected? And why was the four weeks selected? Oh, those are great questions. So um, the class two device, um, which is set to a certain amount of, of pressure, um, was decided upon based on the data available at that time. Um, and basically previous studies, including um, institutional studies, single arm prospective studies that looked at this. And, and the feeling was that that level of compression, that type of device um, was felt to be the most standard early intervention technique. So that was a multi, multi investigator discussion. Um, and it was felt to be the best choice at the time um, in terms of garments. Um, in terms of the four weeks, um, again, that is something that's been studied in, in other areas. And so we, we incorporated kind of the best level of data um, I think also having a four week intervention is great because it lets you basically assess intervention, assess response. Um, and so it's something that I think is really good for patient compliance as well. So I think that wasn't the driver for that reason, but I think that's a um, additional benefit to having something that's a four week intervention is that you're able to kind of maximize compliance. Okay, and if a patient didn't respond after four weeks in the PREVENT trial, what happened? So what would happen is if, um, you know, following intervention, all patients were subsequently followed with tape measure for consistency, right? The idea is that at that point, we wanted everyone in the intervention arm to be treated um, regardless of their original surveillance the same, so that there was a kind of unbiased approach to both arms. Um, and if they, you know, after tape measure, sorry, after um, compression garments still had, you know, a greater than 10%, they were sent for complex decongestive physiotherapy. And in, in practice, so that was the study in practice, if a patient is in compression therapy for four weeks and doesn't respond, what do you do? Um, I think it's there's certainly discussion there. I mean, think you know if they don't respond to compression, um, there's certain options available that that may not have been part of the study. Um, for example, you know I, I may send them to a colleague um, who specializes things like uh, lymph lymphovenous bypass or lymph node transfer. I may send them for physical therapy. I think that will depend on the patient, their interests, and kind of a discussion of the pros and cons of different um, interventions at that point. Okay, thank you. Um, and interesting question, and you know, Dr. Shuri, I know that when you were practicing uh, occupational medicine, you oversaw 22 facilities as part of a large healthcare system in Illinois. And we have a question here about how do you educate your staff? So if, um, if you have a program in place and you want the staff to be educated about the protocols, um, any advice you have based on your experience from then? The best advice I could give would be to 
to find a champion for this, whether or not that is uh, a, a, a breast surgeon that just has that personable mm, about them, right? They got the data, they have the patients, they have the load, they have the uh, uh, bedside manner, individuals that can relay this message not only to physicians and to the powers that be within the organization, but also a physician who can relay this on the patient side, because I really think an institution that really wants to take um, the, the entire patient, address the entire patient, the whole patient, make sure that they are healthy and whole, would want um, an opportunity to not only have their staff aware of the um, opportunities that we have with the SOZO device and LDEX uh, testing, but that they would also be able to now uh, advocate to patients as to why it's important why it's beneficial so that the patients don't feel like, oh, I'm just coming in and getting yet another testing. I'm a pin cushion. They're going to do another thing. You want someone who truly gets it, who has the passion behind the data, but also the passion behind the patient. So there are certain individuals, it may be the chairman of surgery. It may be the head breast surgeon that's doing the most cases. It may be the med onc who is doing all types of research studies. I think from institution to institution, it depends upon how your layers of uh, accountability, accountability fall. Um, there are some institutions who could have their CMO present to the executive staff. This is what is out there. This is what we want to do for our patients, for our community. Okay, I need a champion to get this going. You know, at my old institution, the CMO would have been that person. And then and it would have trickled down to the CEO at each of the different individual hospitals that we were at. And from there, down to the CMOs. But if you are an individual hospital, I want you to think about who seems to be the champion of wanting to make sure that cancer patients are well provided for, and they have that personality that can reach physicians and patients, that's the person that you bring in mind and say, you know what, let me bring them this new information because this would be great for our institution. I need somebody to champion it for us. Thank you, Dr. Cherie, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, it is the second day of Lymphedema Awareness Month and we're happy to bring this webinar to all of you uh, to be able to talk about the latest clinical evidence supporting prevention of lymphedema. Thank you, Dr. Shaw and Dr. Shuri. Our next webinar will take place on uh, April 21st at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll begin again discussing lymphedema prevention with physicians um, representing academic community and private practice. So we'll have Dr. Amir Gambarawala with Advocate Healthcare. Dr. Laura Lawson, breast surgeon at the Nashville Breast Center and medical director of the Ascension St. Thomas Breast Cancer Program, and Dr. Stephanie Valente, the breast surgeon and associate professor and director of the Breast Surgery Fellowship Program at the Cleveland Clinic. If you'd like to view replays of past webinars, please visit our YouTube oncology channel. And while you're there, be sure and subscribe. And if you would like a certificate of completion for this webinar, please go ahead and respond to your registration email. Email us at info at impedimed.com or contact your impedimed representative. We'd be happy to provide that again. Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, thank you, Dr. Shree and Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Good night, everyone.